Today we're in Psalm 107. We're going to be looking today at the psalm. We'll begin reading together at verse 1. And because it contains some 43 verses, uh, rather than reading the whole psalm to you, I'll begin by reading verses 1 through 3, give a basic introduction, then pick up at verse 4 and move on through the psalm. Psalm 107, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3, the psalmist writes, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. And so as we begin here, let me briefly give you an introduction. Let me say to you that here in Psalm 107, we begin what, are, what is called the fifth book of Psalms. The Psalms consist of 150 songs or Psalms, but they're broken into five books. The first five books or the first books, uh, book one in other words, is uh, Psalm 1 through 41, and book two was Psalm 42 through 72. Book three is Psalm 73 through 89. Book 4 is Psalm 90 through 106, and then this is the fifth book, Psalms 107 to 150. And so as we look at this particular psalm here that begins the conclusion, if you will, of the book of Psalms, this is a song of thanks to the Lord our God. Notice how he begins with praise and he begins with thanks to God for God's goodness towards his people. And as he does so, he begins to thank God for all the times that the Lord has shown the nation mercy. As we look at this, we're going to see that he begins by enumerating the times God has delivered them in their time of need, which reminds us of what the psalmist said in Psalm 46, verse 1, when he said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our time of trouble. So beginning here in verse 1 and reading verses 1 and 2, he begins by saying, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now, as you look at this, because verse 3 says that he has gathered them out of the lands east and west, north and the south, there are many who believe that this psalm may have been written uh, right after the Babylonian exile. Israel had turned her back on the Lord and, and actually has a history of doing so. If you read your Old Testament, you'll see that it wasn't too long after that God had brought them into uh, his, his uh, covenant relationship that the nation of Israel uh, began to rebel against the Lord. And so in this particular context, Israel has turned her back on the Lord, has entered into idolatry, and as a result, they've been taken captive. And their enemies have transported them to a foreign land. It's more than likely that this is speaking of when they were taken into Babylon. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah speaks of this in chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, when the Lord God said, this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years, and then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I'll, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, saith the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. Jeremiah 29.10 says, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I'll visit you, perform my good word toward you, and cause you to return to this place. And so um, conservative scholars believe that this particular psalm, Psalm, psalm 107, may have been written during that time when they're returning from Babylonian captivity. Now, as you see this, it speaks in terms of its context that this could be speaking of an event that already transpired, but it also can be a picture of the last days. I want you to notice that because he says uh, in verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. You see, in the last days, God has promised that he would, he would regather the nation of Israel. Now, we who are in the 21st century probably don't really appreciate how dynamic that truly is. But if you're one who studies your Bible and all, especially one who prepares Bible studies, then you know that all the way into the early 1900s, the Bible commentators when they would be writing concerning passages that related to the last days, very often spiritualized the nation of Israel, and many of them basically replaced the nation of Israel with the church because they would say that the nation of Israel ceased to exist 
You know, in A.D. 70, there is no nation of Israel after Titus of Rome decimated Israel, and the Jews were scattered throughout the world. And so when you study some of the commentators during that era, very few, if any at all, really ever think that the nation of Israel will ever be regathered. To them, it was a concept that was beyond them. And so they would spiritualize the promises, and they would say, well, you know, this is really uh, applying to the church and, and all of that. And yet, in 1948, when the nation of Israel once again regained its, its identity in the world, it caused many people to wonder at that in that there never has been a time when a nation has been scattered throughout the world and regathered to become that nation once again. That has never happened in history. And so those who are familiar with prophecy and all not only see this as having a uh, fulfillment when the, the, the Jews left Babylonian captivity according to God's Word and, and regathered in, in uh, the nation of Israel, but it also has a prophetic last days application. If you take notes, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 5 and 6, God says, Fear not, for I'm with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Ezekiel 39, 27, 28, when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I'm hollowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. That will take place in the last days. What we have seen is the budding, if you will, of the fig tree, the nation of Israel once again having life. It hasn't completely become fulfilled in a prophetic sense, but we've seen that it has begun. Now, when he says in verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy... That ought to be the prime motivator for us sharing our faith with other people. We have been redeemed. We have been purchased by the Lord. And if somebody says, but what do I have to say? And I want you to see this. It says in verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Well, somebody says, well, what does that mean? What do you mean I'm supposed to say so? What am I supposed to say? Well, one, what you're supposed to say is that the Lord is good. And two, you're supposed to say that, that his mercy endures. And three, that you've been redeemed by him. Listen, if you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that's plenty to talk about. And he's saying, let him say so. In other words, don't be a consistently, constantly, totally silent witness. Well, of course, we are to be a witness at all times, and when necessary, we should speak forth our faith, of course. But our life should speak so loudly that people know that we worship, uh, worship the true and living God. That's, there's no doubt about that. But we also need to have an explanation concerning the hope that lies within us. We ought to be able to, to say to people, look, this is the reason I am the way that I am. If you see anything that you think is good, it's because of what the Lord has done in my life. God is good. God is merciful. God has redeemed me. God has purchased me back. And the way that he purchased us was through the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, at one time, the Bible says very clearly that at one time we were slaves. We were slaves to sin. Our lives were wholly given over to sin. That was our chief delight. That was our pleasure. That was our activity. That was our nature. That's simply who we were and what we did. And Jesus made it very clear that we at one time were slaves, but that he sets us free. In John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I've, I've spoken to numerous people over the years, and the bottom line is, is, is when, when they're in one of their more open and honest modes, when they're actually speaking the truth, you know, when they're actually speaking about what their life really is, and they're honest about it, they'll admit, they'll admit that they have sin in their life and they're in bondage to it. Jesus Christ came to set you free from your sin. You know, I've been listening to a number of speakers recently and I've been reading various things recently, uh, even just today, how that um, some churches today are afraid, pastors are afraid to speak forth what the gospel actually has to say because, well, because a lot of people today don't want to hear that they're not perfect. 
a lot of people today want to hear that they're really better, that they're good people. Americans especially love to hear how good they are. Americans want to hear what their purpose is in life. They want to have a purpose in life and all. And, and very often they don't want to know that that purpose is to worship the Lord and to be saved out of their sin. They want to do things. They want to be good in, in a certain sense, but they don't want to take their religion too seriously. Something like 87% of Americans uh, will answer to some form of Christian faith. I mean, you can speak to them, and, and they will say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, something like 87%. That's a recent figure. I just heard that within the last three days. 87%. And yet, if 87% of the United States is Christian, then who are all the people who are committing all the crimes? Who, you know, who are those people? Who are all the people who are getting the divorces? Who are all the people in, in our nation that are, are doing so many things that are wrong. You know, is that all the born-again Christians? Or isn't it true that many people think that they are believers simply because they've gone to church before, they were baptized, or perhaps they, uh, you know, they just consider themselves to be Christian because they're not a Muslim and not a Buddhist, Buddhist or, or something of that nature? Well, I think that that's true. Uh, one of the things we need to understand is that before we were saved, we were not only sinners, but we were in bondage. And when the Lord sets you free from your sin... When the Lord sets you free, when you, when you finally understand that God has done something to release you, then you're going to say so. That's exactly what happened in my life. I got saved, and I just said so. I started telling my mom. I started telling my dad. I started telling my brother. I told my sisters. I told my friends. I told the people who would be willing to listen. I didn't know anything other than once I was lost and now I'm found, once I was spiritually blind and now I see, once I was spiritually deaf but now I can hear the voice of the Lord, once I was entangled with this yoke of bondage but Jesus Christ has set me free. And I was amazed by that. And so I began to just say what I knew. Now if you do that, if you just trust the Lord, just say, God, I just want to tell people about what you're doing in my life. God will bless you. Now. If you've been backsliding or you're lukewarm or you haven't been pursuing the Lord, don't be surprised that you don't have anything to say. Or if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, well, you can't speak about that which you don't have. But if you give your heart to the Lord and God begins to do works in you, just open your mouth. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Just be willing to speak and stand up and be counted. And so this is basically what he's talking about here. Now, as we pick up in verse 4, he begins to speak concerning uh, what has taken place in the life of the nation. Verse 4, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for habitation. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. So notice verse 4 says, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. And when it speaks of this wandering in the wilderness, it could refer to the 40 years of wandering, but it also can speak of their experiences in exile. Now, the word wandered there, wandered in the wilderness, it speaks of how that they have wandered or been in error. They've been astray. They've been lost. They, sta they staggered in a wasteland. So physically, their bodies, as they were doing that, they're, they're, they're wandering and staggering around. But it also includes the spiritual reality of their life and their emotionality. Fact is... Without the Lord, you're going to stagger in the world without any form of anything that causes you to have refreshment. Turn with me for a moment to Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show you something there. Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show you something found in verses 1 through 3. Wandering around. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, for those of you who are hunting right now. General Electric Power Company, that'll help you. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, 
among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now, I want you to notice when he says, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, according to the course of this world. That word walked is a Greek word that means meandered or walked about aimlessly. He's basically saying that before you had a relationship with the Lord, your life had no direction. You were aimless in your pursuits. You moved from one thing to another. Your life was haphazard. Perhaps you pursued one thing for a while. It didn't satisfy you. So you pursued something else. That didn't satisfy you. When you're young, you might think if you set certain goals that those goals are going to fulfill you. So you want to have a relationship or you want to have an education or you want to have a certain job or you want to have a certain career. And you make that your goal. Everybody's been telling you that's what you ought to do. Your mom, your dad, and your society in general has basically said to you, if you set these goals and aim high and achieve them, you're going to be satisfied. Well, the bottom line is, is you might satisfy yourself. You might receive those goals. But once you have gotten those goals, attained those goals, you find that it hasn't really, really measured up to your expectation. There are, there are certain things, and I can talk from an, from an older man's perspective now to a younger person, and I can tell you that. I can say that there are certain goals that you might have that you might achieve, and basically once you have achieved those goals, you begin to look around saying, is that all there is? There's got to be something else. It didn't fulfill me. It didn't satisfy me. That can be true in basically any, any pursuit that you have. And so you pursue things seeking a purpose, seeking some kind of, of, of satisfaction, and the bottom line is, is nothing material will ever satisfy a spiritual hunger. Nothing that you ever achieve physically will ever, ever have any kind of satisfaction in the spiritual realm. It doesn't work that way. So you can become very wealthy, and you can become very successful, and you can become what you want. You can go to school, get your degrees, and get that fine job. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that in and of itself. But if that's your whole purpose in life, if you think that once you have that, you're going to have the end achieved, we who are older will tell you that's not true. Because once you've achieved that end, then there are other things that you're going to want to do because that will not satisfy you. You might have your mindset that you want to have a certain person, be with that person, date that person, marry that person, and be with that person the rest of your life. But if that person's your whole goal in life, if you think you're going to receive full satisfaction by that human being, obviously, well, you are unmarried. You haven't gotten married yet because you'll discover that that just does not happen. Because that isn't going to happen in your life because a human being can't meet that need. You have a God-shaped hole in your heart that only Jesus himself can fill. And so spiritually what happens is God is saying to you, listen, if you want to drink of this salt water for a while, it's only going to continue to make you thirsty because the water of the world never satisfies. That's why Jesus said, if you drink of the water that I give to you, that's going to satisfy you. The one who drinks of the water that this age has to offer, that this world has to offer, only thirsts again. But when you drink of Jesus Christ, you never thirst again because he satisfies you in every way. And so they wandered. You can turn on back to um, Psalm 107. They wandered. They meandered, if you will. They were out there in error. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Great picture of somebody who doesn't know the Lord. But in their wandering, verse 6, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city for habitation. So in their wandering, they cried out. The words cried out means that they cried out loudly in distress to the Lord. The Bible tells us in Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. And as they cried out to him, his response was to deliver them out of their distresses. In other words, he heard their prayer. He heard the prayer of his people who were in trouble and he blessed them. He delivered them and he led them. And not only that, but he gave them a place that they might dwell. Notice verse 7. He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city for habitation. He took them to a place that they might dwell. You're wandering spiritually. In the midst of your wandering, you cry out and say, God, help me. I'm lost. I'm dying here. The Lord hears your cry and delivers you to a place that you can live. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus said it like this. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I go to prepare a place for you. When you were crying out in the wilderness, when you were meandering through life seeking a purpose, Jesus Christ heard your cry when you said, God, deliver me, and he now has a place of habitation for you that he's been preparing and waiting for you that one day you'll be with him. This particular scripture that I just quoted to you, John 14, 1 through 3, is a passage of scripture that I have used many times when I have been at the bedside of individuals in this fellowship or relatives who were about to die. I remember in one particular instance when I was invited to go, actually asked to go, my father had asked me to go and see his brother, my uncle Ray. My uncle was in a hospital in Riverside and he had cancer, and I've shared this with, with many of you before. My uncle Ray was uh, my father's, one of my father's younger brothers. And my uncle Ray was, uh, was a very solidly built, very handsome man. As I grew up, I was afraid of him, though, because he had a very loud voice. He was that uncle that would speak loudly to you. And I don't know if you ever had an uncle or anybody like that in your family, but I had kind of a quiet spirit. I know that's something easy to believe. I had a quiet spirit. And my uncle Ray had a very loud voice. And so he would, you know, if I was, you know, right next to him, basically, he'd say, David, come here, you know, and, you know, and he used to scare me when I was a little boy. And uh, he was, he was, you know, good-sized guy, very powerful man, and, um, and I loved him to pieces. He's a very gentle man, but he had a very loud voice and used to scare me as a child. Well, he, he had cancer. And uh, he had come in and to my office, and I had anointed him with oil, and I had prayed for him. He was just so severely decimated by cancer that shortly after that had happened, they hospitalized him. And my father called me up, and my dad said to me, could you come and pray for your uncle? And I said, of course. And I remember going to the hospital, and I remember walking in, and Mike Callahan and I went together, and, and I remember walking into the waiting room. It was filled with people, and I looked at them, and I realized that all of these people were my cousins and, and relatives that I didn't know. I have quite a number of cousins I've never even met. And, and they were all over in that, and cousins and relatives. And as I walked in, I looked at them, and it hit me. This is my family. We've never even gotten to know one another. But my dad came out, and my dad said to me, Son, if you want to see Uncle Ray, you need to come right now. And I remember walking into his room, and my grandmother was there, and one of my other uncles uh, was there. And, and I remember walking in, and my aunt, his wife, my Aunt Billy, was there. She was seated next to him there, and she was just uh, touching his head. And as I walked in, he, he at one time was a good 200-plus pound man, and, and he's now about 125 pounds. And at one time, he, was, he had a mustache and very black, beautiful black hair. His hair was all gone from the different radiation treatments and all. His mustache was gone, and, and he was just, just a, a shell of the man that I grew up, uh, you know, fearing and yet loving. And as I walked into the room, I remember he was there, and he hadn't been stirring at all the whole day. He hadn't made any noise or movement. And I remember walking in as I stood there next to his bed, looking down at him. My Aunt Billy, who I happen to love with all of my heart, turns to me and she said to me, she says, honey, she says, why don't you, uh, why don't you pray for your uncle? And she said, uh, she said, Ray, uh, your nephew David's here. He's going to pray. And my, my uncle, he, he formed the words, and I heard him say the word pray. And so he had actually stirred, and, and I reached down, and I took him by the hand. As I'm looking at the shell of the man that I had known all of my life there, as he was about to die, which he died the next day, as I held his hand there, I began to pray. But before I prayed, I quoted John 14, and I said, Uncle Ray, you committed your heart to Jesus Christ. You committed your heart to Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me, my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and I prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And I prayed for him, and then within a week, spoke at his funeral. You know, the Lord gives you peace that in the midst of all of your wanderings, when you had so much dryness spiritually, well, God says, listen, all you need to do is cry out to me, and I will hear you. And not only will I deliver you, but I will bring to you, I will bring you to a place 
of habitation. Well, we know that that place of habitation is heaven. And so that's what the psalmist is reminding us of. And therefore, in verse 8, he says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. I want you to notice that he says in verse 8, oh, that men would give thanks. It's not limited just to the nation of Israel. God's promises are to all who would come to him. His mercy is not limited, but is actually extensive. And he desires all men to give thanks and praise to him. And I want you to notice why. Because he says he satisfies our souls with goodness. Jesus in John 6, 35 said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Listen, when I gave my heart to Christ um, 34 years ago, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I didn't say, Jesus, come into my life. I'm going to trust you, but uh, just in case you don't have all that I need, I'm going to try Buddha and Muhammad too, if you don't mind. When I came to the Lord, then I have nothing else that I need. When I came to Jesus Christ, I didn't thirst for spiritual things again in the sense of pursuing to find satisfaction because I was satisfied and when I came to Christ, he is the bread of life. He satisfied my spiritual hunger. And that's what it says in verse 9. He satisfies the longing soul, fills the hungry soul with goodness. When you commit your heart to the Lord, he satisfies you in every way. It may be that if you're not satisfied tonight, that you need to recommit yourself to him. And verse 10, those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down. There was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, broke their chains in pieces. He goes on to say, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. He has broken the gates of bronze and cut down and cut the bars of iron in two. Now, notice he says those who sat in darkness in verse 10. Suffering takes many forms. He delivers those who wander in the wilderness, but he also delivers those who are prisoners in bondage. And these are revealed, interestingly, those who are in bondage. These are revealed as those who have rebelled against his word and his counsel, which I find really interesting. Notice verse 10 and 11, those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Listen, if you want to do things on your own, if you want to run your own life, I believe that the Lord is very willing to allow that to take place. But the result is you're devoid of wisdom and counsel and you end up in bondage. That's exactly what takes place. And so when you find yourself in that particular situation, what do you do? Well, you cry. You cry out to the Lord. That's what he's saying in verse 13. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Now, while in prison, this is interesting, the rebellious spirit is broken. And while they are being broken, while in prison, they humble themselves and call out to God. You know, over the years, we've seen... Uh, a number of, of individuals who at one time were members of our fellowship who made a decision to just rebel against what the word of the Lord says, and they ended up in jail. We've had more than one of our members in jail, and, um, and then they get us, get, write a letter, you know, and the, sometimes I'll get one of their letters. Most of the time it goes to one of the other men, but, and they'll say, you know what, I've, I've learned a lot while being here in jail, and when I get out, and I'm going to serve the Lord, you know, because God allowed them to do what they wanted, but they ended up in, in chains, in prison, in bondage. But you cry out, and it doesn't really matter where you're at when you do so. You can get saved in this room. You could get saved in your house. You can say, get saved in your car. You can get saved anywhere, but they cry out while they're in jail, and, and, and the Lord answers their prayer. So what happens? Well, when your chains are broken, you begin to praise the Lord. Psalm 142, verse 7 says, Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. In verse 17, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. 
Their soul abhorred all manner of food. They drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And so some are recognized here, and I want you to notice how he begins in verse 17 by using the word fools. Some are recognized as fools because they enjoy sin and they enjoy wickedness. A fool is someone who despises wisdom and instruction, and he's saying their foolishness has resulted in illness that's taken away their love of food and their love of pleasure. I, I have often thought this question, and I just wrote it to myself, what does the world have to offer you when you are on your deathbed? When somebody's dying, and I promise you, I've been there, seen this, when somebody is dying, they are normally not laying there saying, man, I wish I would have sinned some more. They're not sitting there saying, man, I wish that I had a better car. I promise you they're not. They're not sitting there saying, man, I wish I'd have worked more on my physique or I wish I'd have dyed my hair because it's too gray right now. I'm dying. They don't think that way. I promise you they don't. They don't talk about material things at all. You know what they talk about? That they wasted their life. They talk about what they wish they would have done. They talk about how empty things have been. That's what they talk about. They talk about where their life has been and the things that they've done and how foolish they've been, and that's what happens. You see, when you get caught up with pursuing things that don't matter, every one of us will ultimately, will ultimately die. It's appointed unto men to die once, and after this, the judgment. And I've seen more than one person who has had a, had a, a, a bedside confession where they basically wanting to make things right with God right there because they know that they're going to close their eyes here and they're going to one day in that moment, they're going to be facing him. And they have this sense in their mind, I wanted things to be done differently. That's what he's speaking about here. That's what he's speaking about. A fool did not seek God's wisdom and counsel. They hated those things, but at the end, there's nothing that gives them pleasure and there's nothing that they have that is worth giving up heaven for. Verse 23, those who go down to the sea in ships who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep, for he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like drunken, a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Now, obviously, he's speaking concerning sailors, but those who, are, those who work with nature or, or work around nature very often become very acquainted with the power of nature. And in seeing the power of nature, they can see also, if they have eyes to see, the power of God. Sailors are familiar with the awesome might of the ocean. And sometimes when they've been in the midst of a storm, their hearts will melt. Now, obviously, I couldn't help but think of what just recently happened with the tsunami the incredible destruction of nature, incredible destruction. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything you haven't heard, but I was listening to a, a news broadcaster today who was saying that the number had gone up at that time, and it's much beyond that now, of course, but this was in the morning. They said there are at least 58,000 who have died at that was this morning. And this news commentator was saying that uh, they have a news source that stated that it may be that there are over 100,000 who died in Indonesia alone. We were watching the news, and you see the waves breaking and, and coming on to the shore. And you see people grabbing hold of things and holding on as much as they can. And the might of that wave as it's receding, just peeling them off and taking them out to their doom. Then you hear of the miraculous things like that precious little guy, that little baby who was found wandering, you know, two years old or so. And his uncle opened up the internet and he saw the picture of his nephew and he came to claim him. You, you hear of the young lady who is from Southern California who is a student at UC Berkeley and 
she's afraid of water, so her mother encourages her, oh, go with this friend of, you know, this family, uh, family friends, and, and, and go and learn to scuba dive and, and get over your fear of the water, and she doesn't want to do that. But she goes and she starts taking her certification course to scuba dive, and on her final dive, so that she can receive certification, she's under the water, and while she's under the water, she sees that the, the fish, rather than scattering, begin to cluster. And she's thinking, how unusual is this, when suddenly she is thrust forward and then she shoots down 45 feet, then she's finding herself uh, in the midst of all kinds of silt and everything and sand is swirling around her and she's thinking that this is normal. She doesn't know that this is not normal. And her instructor motions for her to go to the top and they go up, they, they come out and they look and that, that tsunami, that wave had rushed over and hit the shore and they could see that it had peeled everything off. Think about that for a minute. I don't know if you know this, perhaps you do, but those waves, those tsunamis have been known to outrun jet airplanes. There have been jets that are flying 500 miles an hour and they have seen the tsunami pass them. That's how fast they go. And they usually are building up their power as they're approaching the shore. When that hits, the awesome power of the, of the wave, when it hits, there's nothing that can survive that. One of the most powerful natural disasters that anybody ever encounters is the power of water. When you have floods, when you have waves like that, the massive power, unbelievable. Well, he's speaking about how awesome the ocean is. And he's speaking about the sailors who go out there and when they see these mountains of waves coming, how it causes their hearts to tremble. And notice it, verse 23, they go down to the sea in ships who do business on great waters. They see the works of the Lord, his wonders in the deep. He commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like drunken man and are at their wit's end. It's just showing the power of that wave. Verse 28, then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. He brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they're glad because they're quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. So in the midst of great storms, they cry out to God, he says, and God delivers them. We see that in, in Scripture, in instances found, there's more than one, but in instances found in Mark chapter 4. You remember this. It's found in verses 36 through 41. In Mark chapter 4, verses 36 through 41, uh, the Scripture says, When they had left the multitude, they took Jesus along in the boat as he was. Other little boats were also with him, and a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? They feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus, the Lord and master over nature. Verse 29 says, he calms the storm so that its waves are still, and he guides them to their desired haven. The result of that, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Verse 32, let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people. Verse 33, he, all, he turns rivers into a wilderness, the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He turns a wilderness into pools of water, dry land into water springs. There he makes the hungry dwell, that they may establish a city for habitations, and sow fields and plant vineyards, that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them, and they multiply greatly. He does not let their cattle decrease. Now, those verses speak about God who is able to, to humble people. He can bring down the proud, but he also can, can exalt those who are poor and needy. In other words, he's the God who is in control over all things. He's the God who takes care of all things and moves all things. 
He can turn a fruitful land into a wasteland. The point he's making is that he can reverse the condition of anything, which in includes the condition of our lives. And just think about it for just a moment. Your life could have been a waste. Your life could have been barren. It could have been fruitless. But the Lord reached into your life and transformed you. You know, I think about that often. I just, this, just this week, I had a friend of mine uh, who came to visit us. He's from Montana now, but his name is Dan, Dan Renshaw, Dan and Debbie Renshaw. Some of you might recognize his name. Most of you probably won't. Dan was my very first assisting pastor. When our church first began back in 1981, Dan was with me, and uh, he was my very first assistant. He was my first assistant, and Randy Walls, who's now pastor of Calvary Chapel of Upland, was, was right next to him. And uh, we had dinner with him on Sunday after church, and then I invited him to come over on, on Monday, and so he came and visited. He and his family came and visited us. And as we were speaking, we began to mosey on down memory lane together. And some of you probably already know this, perhaps you don't, but before I became the pastor of this church here, I was an assisting pastor in another Calvary Chapel for two years. And I got ordained in, in uh, July of 1979, and Dan was part of the board of that particular church. And the day came in 1981 when I resigned my position of assistant pastor. And what basically had happened in a nutshell is the senior pastor at that time said to me, you aren't called to pastor. What, you're not a pastor. What you are is a counselor. And so I'm removing you from being the assistant pastor, and I'm going to re remove your, your salary. We'll give you 50% of what you're making now. You can go back to school if you'd like, and you can serve here as a counselor, but you're no longer to assist me as a pastor because you don't have a call as a pastor. And I remember looking at him. I was 29, 30 years, 30 years old at the time, and I remember looking at him, and the board was there. There were several men in the board, and I looked at him, and I said, you know, there's not very many things that I know for sure, but one of the things I know for sure is that I'm a pastor. I'm just not called to pastor here. I said, so that's obvious. So what I'll do is I'll resign my position. And so I resigned my position. Now, out of the several men who were part of the board, Dan was one of the men who was there that night. Every one of those men received my resignation except for Dan. Dan looked at me and he said to me, I can't receive your resignation because I don't believe that you haven't been called to serve the Lord. And I said, well, Dan, I appreciate your, uh, your kindness, but I'm resigning uh, effective immediately, and I gave what you call a two weeks notice to the senior pastor. When that was done, if you don't mind, I'll take it a step further. When that was done, then the meeting concluded. Personally, I felt like I had just been hit by a sledgehammer. I felt like I was run over by a train. And uh, emotionally, I can't imagine, I can't explain to you the depth of the emotions that, that were churning inside of me because I just gave up what I really felt God had called me to do. And, and you see, for about six months, I had been telling my wife, Marie, I'm supposed to resign from this position. But Marie was not open to that, so she would refuse to hear me. I'd come home every Monday from board meetings because we had board meetings every Monday, and I would be crying. I'd say, I'm not supposed to be here. But because all of our friends were part of that congregation and because our ministry was there and everything else, Marie just thought that I was going through a tough time. And, but I knew the Holy Spirit was speaking, and I knew that I was supposed to move on. I knew that. And Marie, my wife, wasn't open at that time. And and rather than forcing her hand, I waited on the Lord to speak to her. But I would come home, and I would cry. I would cry every Monday. I'd come home after a three-hour board meeting, and I would weep, and I'd say, I am not supposed to be here. And she thought that I was just a weakling. She just thought, oh, you know, come on, stiff up her lip. Come on, get over it, you know. And that was my wife. She's a real strong woman, and she figured I was just weak. But it was the Holy Spirit who was working in my heart. And so finally, when the, when the pastor said, you know, David, you're not really a pastor, I knew that was God. I knew the Lord was giving, my, giving me my opportunity. And I looked at the pastor, and that's when I said, I, I might not know many things, but one thing I know for sure, I've been called by God as a pastor, and it's just not here. When that was done and Dan refused to receive my resignation, the rest of the guys were willing to, and I resigned my position. And when I did, we were in a house. I walked out of the front door, and Dan walked behind me, and I stood at the front door, and the door closed, and I broke down, and I wept like a child in his arms. I fell on his arms, and I cried. And I said, I don't know what to do. 
I just know I have to go. And Dan wept with me. That's how close he was to me. And he put in his resignation the next week, and he came over when our church began. And he was my dear friend and very close and my first assistant pastor. And he held my hands up whenever we began this ministry. He was with me. And as we were together this last week, and he was here, he hasn't seen this building. He came on Sunday morning, and he was sitting back there. And later on, he said, look what God has done. Look what God has done. See, the Lord takes you in your distress, and he takes you in your pain, and he takes you in your affliction, and he takes you in your bondage. He takes you from when you were in sin, and he redeems you. And you love him. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You love him, and you talk about him, and you praise him through all of those things. And that's what we learn to do. That's what we learn to do. And he can take your situations and reverse them. From a time of barrenness, he can make you fruitful. Or when you are so self-assured that you're doing things on your own, he can give you a time of barrenness so that you begin to cry out to God and say, Lord, you've got to rescue me. You've got to deliver me. It can be one way or the other, but all along, he's going to get the praise. He's going to get the praise. And so in verse 39, when they are diminished and brought low, through oppression, affliction, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes, causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet he sets the poor on high, far from affliction, makes their families like a flock. The righteous see it and rejoice, and all iniquity stops its mouth. So God humbles and brings down the proud, and he exalts the humble and the needy. Proverbs 15.33 says, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. Before honor is humility. Proverbs 22, 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And finally, verse 43, whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. You become wise, now notice this, whoever is wise will observe these things. You become wise by watching carefully, by carefully watching how God works among men. And wisdom instructs us concerning how to know the Lord, how to trust, and how to praise Him. So whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. The way that you understand the loving kindness of the Lord is by experiencing it. And as you experience the loving kindness of the Lord, as the redeemed, you're going to say so. And that's what God has called us to, guys. Let's remember that always, just to remember the kindness and the goodness of the Lord and to seek Him for His wisdom and to be aware of the fact that God takes us and He takes the brokenness and He heals it and God blossoms us and blesses us as we serve Him. May our hearts always be turned to Him. And may we be able to say, he is our God, and I love him with all of my heart.